when I was in middle school, like I just used to ask boys out all the time and they would say no. And I'd be like, okay, that's cool. I'm going to ask someone else out. <laughs> like it didn't, it didn't crush me. It didn't, I don't know what, what that was, but I, I, I laughed thinking about it. There was this one boy I asked him out three times and he said no each time. And I don't think I was overwhelmingly sad about it. I was like, okay, well, just going to move on to my next victim. So <laughs> I was just really unafraid. And, yeah. but certainly you have so many doubts when you're writing a book, you, you know, oscillate between, you know, what I'm doing is absolute trash and this is actually really great. So having to temper some of that, especially when you're writing a book on bragging um, at some <laughs> I point. I imagine. Yeah, that's kind of like, weird. Well, it's funny because I also, I'm, you know, a lot of writers want to like hold onto their books and just like pet it and like just stay yeah. with it forever. And I was like, get this the fuck out of there. This is the best I can do on my own. Like get it out of there. And I think all of that stems from 10 years of running my own business and like understanding that perfect is like the enemy of done. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. I was wearing the wrong foundation shade for years, and no one told me. Thanks, guys. Then I discovered Il Maquillage, the bold new beauty brand using AI to shade match. Their best-selling Woke Up Like This foundation has 50,000 five-star reviews and is a total game-changer for my glow-up. Plus, it's cruelty-free. You can even try before you buy at home for 14 days, risk-free. Take the quiz and get your shade of flawless at ilmakiage.com slash quiz. That's I-L-M-A-K-I-A-G-E dot com slash quiz. Meredith, welcome to The Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, it is my pleasure to have you here. So I actually found out about your book by way of two people. One from one of our former guests who recommended you as somebody I should talk to, which to me, that is always the ultimate litmus test. Uh, but then I actually got an email from your publicist about this book, Brag Better, Mastering the Art of uh, Fearless Self-Promotion. And when I saw that, I was like, yeah, I think that that is something that is such an issue for so many people. But before we get into all of that, um, I want to start by asking you what I think is, is somewhat of a relevant question to this. What social group were you a part of in high school and what impact did that ha- end up having on the choices that you've made throughout your life? And <laughs> um, so I am a dork. I've always been a dork. Um, I was definitely, I wouldn't say, God, if you say like you're not part of a social group, that means like, you know, we know, all know what that means. So uh, I would say that I was the girl with the really, really, really good study guides. Um, all I did was work. Um, and I was like, I can't hang out. I have to do my homework. Uh, goody two shoes to the core. Um, so the really good study guides, I was not sharing them with the, you know, burnouts that wanted them. Um, <laughs> and I was, I was invited to parties and always like friends with lots of different groups of people. Um, so but I was definitely like the gunner. Um, and you know, my friends were sweet, interesting, also dorks. And then, you know, I would have, I tend to think of my friendships, um, you know, if I ever got married in the traditional sense, which I don't know if I would, or if I'd had bridesmaids in the traditional sense, which again, I don't know that I would, uh, a lot of those people wouldn't know each other. So I like to think of friendships for me as, I mean, I, lean more introverted, which means, you know, I value one-on-one time. So I kind of cherry pick my relationships. I I don't really identify with groups as mm-hmm. much. I can't do that group thing, think thing. It, it freaks me out. Um, and so that's, I guess how I would say it. I also went to a really small school, so I don't know how many groups there were as in, as, as more just like we were all in it together. Yeah. Well, so there are two things that come for that. One, I, I wonder is how much of this was instilled by parents? Because, you know, I think when you grew up in an Indian family, work ethic is just sort of a, a given. My roommate was asking me, he said, so basically the expectation in your house was that you just got A's. He was like, what kind of grades did you get? I was like, oh, straight A's. I was like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, if you came up with a B, it was just like, what the hell happened here? Uh, well, I mean, so, you know, like what, what was your, your parental environment? Yeah, like, was this so, kind of instilled by them? So they were hard on me. I was hard on me. And my school was also very intense. So all of those things were like recipe for very good study guides. Um, Mm. But that was so, so yes, good grades were like not even a question. 
um, you know, I'm Jewish, Jewish families and parents value intensely education and the person that recommended me, Sarah Hurwitz, one of my, one of my very close <laughs> yeah. friends. Uh, yeah. So, you know, Jews in general, um, you know, I won't attribute all of it to Judaism, but right. um, this understanding of learning and excelling intellectually. I also grew up in the media and politics bubble of Washington, which is, you know, peak intellectualism um, at its finest. So I'd say there's that piece. And then though coupled with, so my mom uh, always worked and she is a loud person. She always says what she thinks. She has absolutely no trouble um, speaking up for herself. In fact, staying quiet for her is absolutely not an option. Uh, so I think I saw that coupled with having a father who's a journalist and a pundit and seeing um, that you do your work, but you talk about it in public. Um mm -hmm for a job. So I think those yeah. two things combined, then combined with my like goody two shoesness, like, you know, sitting with the teachers and like telling them I like their blouse, um, mm -hmm. that whole vibe, that energy was, uh, just sort of, I was obsessed with grades, um, and completely obsessed, uh, just t too much, way, way, way too much. So and many, many years later, um, so I went to the University of Pennsylvania. It was not even a question to me that like I wasn't going to, you know, murder myself to get into an Ivy League school. That m was all that mattered. Um, I actually was waitlisted at Penn and at Harvard. And my mom said to me, you know, I only know two people that have gotten off of the Harvard waiting list, a Kennedy and someone who donated a million dollars. We're not doing either. Um, <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm going to Penn. Um, I didn't even uh -huh. like it that much when I toured it. Uh, I thought there yeah. wasn't enough grass. Um, I thought that, you know, it was, it, I just didn't like it. But I was like, I mean, I didn't murder myself for the past four years in high school and then even beyond that in middle school um, to not go to an Ivy. And I think that my my um, metrics, especially being an entrepreneur and seeing the economy we are in now is very different. But um, yeah, it was not even a question that like, I had to get the best grades possible and um, all my teachers knew that I would also spontaneously combust if I didn't. So <laughs> I think that was the vibe. So growing up as a daughter of a journalist in the midst of this sort of, you know, what you called intellectualism uh, bubble in, in DC, you know, and somebody who actually does play a huge role in media. Uh, when you look at our, our current media landscape today, you know, <clears throat> between sort of what is happening from, you know, the white house on down, what do you think is the responsibility of media creators today? Like what parts of, of, you know, the narrative can we actually do something about? Because I, like, I realize that everything I put on to the show actually contributes to this in some way or another. Yeah. So, so brag better is about a lot of things, but one of the things it's about is all my time in and around media from my family to starting my own PR shop to being a freelance writer since I was 18 years old. I was just like always such a major fucking underachiever, um, you know, stems from probably deep, deep seated feelings of inadequacy. Um, but, you know, I was watching this really, really intense inverse relationship between volume and merit, which was just that we rewarded loud. Um, this presidency is the most stark example. Um, and so I care so much that people that have done the work, um, I identify my audience as the qualified quiet, people that have done the work but don't know how to talk about it. That is my term. That is basically all of us. But we have a couple people screaming and then the rest of us that don't know where to begin and all I, I mean, there are a lot of things I care about that people get out of this book, you know, that your accomplishments are worth talking about, that you feel um, worthy, that you feel okay talking about them. But honestly, like, we are in a crisis of truth. We are in a crisis of information. Um, and if you've done the work and know the stuff, like, we desperately need to hear from you. So that's more broad than, like, media creators. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, the level of, like, you know, misinformation and falsehood that exists and is so pervasive in media. Um, and I'm talking about like everything from trolls to and on social media to just people really trying to obscure the truth. Um, I mm -hmm. think that, you know, it's, it's really hard because it's a business. So, you know, they want clicks, they want to maintain ads. They want like, that's how they make money and stay alive. But, um, you know, the facts really matter. And I really just care that people who 
um, know their shit, start talking about it. And I, I wasn't really, I've been working on this concept since 2013. It's now 2020. And I, I thought some about releasing it in a, in a presidential, you know, election year. Um, but not, so much. And it didn't occur to me, uh, how much I think this is actually civic duty, um, mm-hmm. to talk about what, you know, I'm sorry. It's really hard to talk about your accomplishments, but like, we are so fucked. Um, so please do. <laughs> so something that you, you alluded to, um, you know, when you said that, you know, you're an underachiever, it, the, yeah, it stems from this deep sense of inadequacy. And I remember coming across a section of the book where you said that you were bullied when you were younger. And, you know, I, I kind of wonder, you know, how you connect the dots between that and kind of leading to this, because I feel like there has to be a connection to that. Like, how did that shape and influence, you know, how you've ended up here and how you work with your clients? Yeah. Um, I mean, listen, I've always been a try hard. Um, I've always been annoying. There was a great article that I saw. I don't remember who wrote it that stemmed from a Twitter about, I mean, this is a, a lot of this is, um, I think ingrained with gender and latent, you know, sexism, but, um, I was not afraid to say things and use my voice and ask, always raise my hand for questions and like be a teacher's pet. And I think that annoyed a lot of people and also made them not nice to me. Um, I was also, you know, chunky. And so then I became very funny. Um, you know, I love former fat kids, like they're just my peeps. Um, I think that, I just had this chip and something to prove. And so that's why I try so hard. Um, I think that I also grew up in groups of people that were extremely successful um, in whatever they were doing. So that added a lot of pressure. Um, And so I think that the bullying piece, like, especially, I mean, you know, we're recording this sort of the midst of quarantine and Corona, but it's like, I still have dreams about middle school girls. Like, it's like, you know, like the girls that weren't nice to me, like, like, come on, I'm 33 years old, like enough already. Um, like, why are you here? Uh, and, and so that sucked. It sucked. It was formative. You know, nothing is worse than, than being, you know, not treated well, as a kid um but yeah. also as like a young girl especially like you know being a 13 like i wouldn't wish being a 13 year old girl on I, anyone i wouldn't wish being a teenager up on anyone yeah <laughs> yeah anymore. i mean teenager too but like that middle school girl piece yeah. um i just think about like i would wait i mean i'm i'm very into fashion and do some stuff in fashion and i i remember one like i would wear like interesting outfits that i thought were cool and God, I had those Jenko jeans that were like really wide leg and I put my hair in like a bun or something and put like chopsticks in my hair. I was like, this looks cool. Like this looks super fucking fresh. Um, everyone's gonna think I'm awesome. And, um, they didn't, but, uh, (laughs) it was hard. I mean, it also, I don't know, it, it definitely is formative for so many successful people. I mean, nobody who peaked in high school, um, is out here you know, desperately trying to seek approval. I don't think. Yeah. Well, I think it's an interesting paradox that you are teaching people how to brag about their accomplishments, uh, which is effectively almost the polar opposite of of what your experience is. I mean, then again, maybe that is the whole reason. Like one of my roommates said, he's like, I get it now. He said, your whole reason for why you do this. He said, what you crave more than anything is human connection. I said, yeah, it's not a coincidence that I chose to build a platform where I never stop meeting new people. Yeah. Um, and I've thought about that. I've thought about this. You know, I talk about this in a professional context. Um, I'm very proud that Publishers Weekly wrote a nice review of Brag Better um, and talks about how a lot of these skill sets apply to other facets of your life. I'm very keen that like this is about touting your professional accomplishments. I was still undeterred from doing it. Like even though people weren't nice to me, it didn't silence me. And I think it's the, the, the mom I have as a role model, um, the dad I have as a professional and role model in that way. Um, it didn't silence me. It didn't, it, it just didn't. And maybe some of it was oblivion or maybe it was just a stronger sense of self um, that, that, you know, I, I don't know if this made into the book, but the yearbook editor, 
you know, we have your friends would submit like in the future we will see. And I, I don't know if she switched mine out or people didn't have nice things to say, but you know, it said, we'll see Meredith Feynman not raising her hand so much in class. Um, and I think about that a lot because, um, I'm still unafraid to ask questions and I wish that on others around me too. I mean, I think about some of the things I've said, I've, you know, have been said to me, uh, as a young woman, as a woman entrepreneur, as a woman in business, whether it's like, you know, a lot of the themes of brag better and women in silencing of their voices, like this is all just sort of stock classic, um, policing of, of women's voices and opinions. And it's different when it's among like teens and kids, but there are so many things that have been said to me, whether it's entrepreneurship is too hard for you, or maybe this is just a bad idea or like, I don't know, maybe we should just like go get married and like do something else. I think about all the women that hear those things and then listen. Um, so I, I just didn't. And so I, I definitely have a strong sense of myself, even though, you know, and that's not to say I didn't have great friends. Like I, um, one of my best, best friends from fourth grade, we were both, you know, I was chunky. She had a bowl cut. Um, and it was, we have this cute, cute picture of us standing back to back when it was like cool to wear matching outfits with your friends. We were both wearing yellow t-shirts and black pants and we look happy. Like we, you know, people weren't necessarily treating us well, but we, you know, had, you know, butchering the quote of that currency of being uncool together. And, and that's still special. Yeah. So you, when you talk about, um, why bragging is so hard, one of the other things that you talk about is imposter syndrome. And you know, the funny thing is I feel like no matter who I talk to, no matter what they've accomplished, um, they all seem to feel this. I remember Danielle Laporte of all people who has sold probably tens of thousands of books has like this massive audience by any account is considered successful. She's like, everybody's faking it. And you, know, you hear that and you're like, wow, really? You feel this too? And I still do at certain moments. Yeah. You know, like I remember when I got my book deal, I was like, I'm the, you know, redheaded. I still say that like, I'm the redheaded stepchild of penguin portfolio. Like I'm the mistake. Yeah. I, that's something that everyone struggles with. So that's tied to bragging, but they're, they're slightly different, but I think, so, you know, the premise of brag better is that it's hard to talk about yourself and your accomplishments, but it's necessary to do so. And you got to figure out how to do it anyway to get what you want professionally and to get the recognition you deserve. Um, and that I know that people that know their shit deserve because the problem is the people we recognize are not the most qualified. And mm. like that just became readily apparent. So I definitely, I don't think it's impo- for me, it's not imposter syndrome as much as it is just like not being nice to myself. But I do think that that the, le- what, what, the, th- the thread between imposter syndrome and being afraid of bragging is certainly um, tied to self-awareness. So, you know, when people say to me, like, oh, people are going to think I'm obnoxious. What if everyone thinks I'm an asshole? Like, what if I brag too much? I'm like, yeah. honestly, the self-aware piece, the questioning piece is what's going to stop you from honestly be physically being able to do that. And I think that's similar mm-hmm. with imposter syndrome, too. If you are a high-achieving, deeply self, you know, I'm crippling, cripplingly self-aware, um, that can lead to a lot of questioning of yourself and your decisions. So I think that like key differential is the self-awareness, um, Uh and the drive and, you know, probably some lack of acceptance of self that is like, well, I got to do better because I'm a joke. Um, so, you know, it's also, it, it was writing this book. I mean, as I said, I've been outlining it since literally 2013 and been trying to sell it to anyone that would listen. I think I got better about some of the imposter syndrome stuff just from getting used to being rejected all the time. Um, Mm -hmm. I started freelance writing when I was 18 um, and I'm okay with being rejected. Um, I also think this like, (laughs) I think about dials back to like when I was in middle school, like I just used to ask boys out all the time and they would say no. And I'd be like, okay, that's cool. I'm going to ask someone else out. (laughs) Like it didn't, it didn't crush me. It didn't, I don't know what, what that was, but I, I, I laughed thinking about it. There was this one boy I asked him out three times and he said no each time. And I, I don't think I was overwhelmingly sad about it. I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to move on to my next victim. Um, so, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, I was just unafraid to, I was just really unafraid and, yeah. and 
I don't know what else to say. I mean, but certainly you have so many doubts when you're writing a book and I'm like, is this abject garbage? When you're a writer, you, you know, oscillate between, you know, what I'm doing is absolute trash and this is actually really great. So, Mm -hmm. um, having to temper some of that, especially when you're writing a book on bragging, um, at some point, <laughs> I imagine, yeah, that's gotta like, be a weird, well, it's funny because experience. I also, I'm, you know, a lot of writers want to like hold onto their books and just like pet it and like just stay yeah. with it forever. And I was like, get this the fuck out of there. This is the best I can do on my own, like get it out of there. And I think all of that stems from 10 years of running my own business and like understanding that perfect is like the enemy of done, like very much has changed since I had those study guides and wanted to get straight A's. Like I understand yeah. the things that also matter and to do a good job, but also not to just murder yourself all the time. So we know a lot of you have been listening to us for years and it means the world to us. What we do here at The Unmistakable Creative wouldn't be possible without the support of our listeners. If the podcast has been valuable to you, one of the best ways you can support us is to subscribe to Unmistakable Creative Prime, which gives you access to transcripts, all of our courses, monthly coaching calls, live chats with our guests, and an incredible community of creatives. And it costs less than you spend on a cup of coffee every month. For the school teachers and people in our education system, Prime is completely free to help you with this transition to teaching online. We've packed it with a ton of value and actionable content, and we hope you'll check it out. Just go to unmistakablecreative.com slash prime to learn more. Again, that's unmistakablecreative.com slash prime. Well, let's get into the entire framework. I mean, you offer us these sort of three pillars of, um, you know, bragging, which are being proud, loud, and strategic. So let's talk about proud because you talk, you know, you kind of give us these three questions to ask, you know, why you're here, what you've done, what your self stats are. When you thought about the, when you said that thing about, you know, being seeming obnoxious, um, <clears throat> I remember one of our copywriters wrote a newsletter for me where he mentioned what I was getting paid to uh, do a keynote speech. And somebody replied back saying it was obnoxious. Hmm. And, you know, I thought, wow, well, it was funny because it was the very thing that would make me credible also made me come across obnoxious to somebody else. Yeah. I mean, so much of, so the, the, I mean, well, so let's back up. What's, what's the question? What's the question here? Yeah. So I guess the the question is, you know, you, you talk about this, like, how do you showcase this? You know, obviously like the things that you're proud of, like what you've done, what these self stats are in a way that, um, you know, actually makes sense. Like, I think that that is the big fear often is that they'll come across obnoxious. So you talk about constructing your bags. And I think that the part in constructing your brags that I would really want to actually have you talk about was this whole idea of verbal undercutting. So Mm -hmm. I guess the question is, you know, how do you showcase what you've done, what you're proud of, and also prevent verbal undercutting? So let's go back to the word brag because it is not a pleasant word. I, you know, use it to be subversive and I'm a PR person. I understand how to get attention. Um, So I use that word for a reason. And I believe that, you know, when you reclaim or when you own language, you win. Um, And so one of the reasons why I use brag is that there are almost no other words to describe talking positively about the work you've done. I mean, there aren't any, like this is the option. Um, And so the definition of brag means to talk about oneself boastfully, which doesn't give you anything. And if you look into boastful, it means to talk about oneself with excessive pride. Um, There's nothing inherently wrong with that. Uh, And excessive, that word excessive is absolutely subjective. Um, So I'm guaranteed piss a lot of people off with my voice and with bragging. And, you know, you're going to it's going to highlight insecurities in other people. It's going to make people uncomfortable. Um, if you're a woman, it's going to be uh, even more complicated. If you are a person of color, it will be in- insanely complicated. So I care that people feel good in their brags and worry less about how it's being received unless it's directly affecting your job and realizing that people are going to talk about what they're going to talk about either way. Mm -hmm. Um, the obnoxious piece, that's a judgment and you don't really know. And, you know, if you think about it, like if you're sending your, let's say you have a 10,000 person newsletter and you're talking about what you get paid for a keynote, one person might think that's obnoxious because maybe they have an issue with money or they know they could never command that, or they would be afraid to get on a stage and give a speech. You're the one putting yourself out there. I mean, it's very easy to take shots at putting, you know, at, at someone who's decided to to voice their opinions and put themselves in public. I put that, you know, in public can mean in your company with people, you know, in a networking situation. Um, And it's way easier to try to shoot them down than it is to like, think about like, Oh, I actually can't do that myself. Mm -hmm. Um, So I care. And I've been in, you know, I remember giving a speech at Stanford and this group of women 
at their women's conference and they were like vibrating with anxiety. And I was like, you guys seem really unhappy. Like, I'm sorry. Um, but you know, they were like, well, what about the studies that say if you're one alone the study that says this and the study said, th-. I was like, you can live and die by a 2000 person, um, you know, sample size or realize that like people are going to say shit either way. So you may as well feel good and like get it out there and like get what you can. Because for all the people that are like, oh, she's so obnoxious, which guaranteed has been said about me, just like say it behind my back. So I don't have to hear it. Um, and I'll be less sad about it. Cause like guaranteed people were saying that. Um, but there are a couple people who would be like, oh, that's awesome. I'm going to reward her for that. Or, oh, I'll hire, I'll hire him for a speech or, wow, you know, I didn't think about charging that much myself. Like actually it's so powerful to tell people what you're paid so that other people who are underpaid can, you know, figure out how to ask for more money and what they deserve. Um, there's so much power in stating what you make. Um, I mean, that's so, so important for so many reasons just to talk about money in general and like nothing is more uncomfortable. Like if you think bragging is uncomfortable, adding the money piece, like (laughs) that's just like everybody's deepest fears. So, you know, in an act of bravery to actually state your fees, um, is pretty rad because a lot of people won't do that. Not for fear of judgment but for fear mm-hmm. of just like vulnerability and being real about money and someone's gonna be like well that's way too much money to charge and someone else can be like well that's not enough so mm-hmm. i don't know i mean i think you can live and die by by those people's opinions um yeah. and then the verbal undercutting piece i talk about the difference between self-deprecation and verbal undercutting the former is if you can do it you got to be careful you know poking fun at yourself being lighthearted, but also driving home a strong message um sort of how, you know, like I can say things like, you know, I'm cripplingly insecure, but I wrote this book and I'm proud of it. You know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's joking. It's whatever it is self-deprecating. Both things are true. Um, and then the verbal undercutting is like, oh, you know, um, this, I'm trying to think of like, you know, similar example, but, um, you know, oh, I don't know if this book is any good. I could try pretty insecure. So like, I don't know, I kind of did my best and like, I hope it turned out okay. I mean, the former endears you to people and I use humor as a way to disarm and, you know, just, just how I communicate. Um, and then the latter makes your listener reader viewer very uncomfortable. Um, Mm. and, and if you're upset about what you're putting out that radiates and that translates. So if I were to post about my book and say like, Oh, like, here's a plug. Like I hate talking about myself, but like, here's a book about literally talking about yourself. So that couldn't apply in this case or to say like, Hey, I'm really (laughs) proud and grateful of the opportunity that I got to like write this book. And I would love for you to pre-order it. Like it's all in the tone too. Like, Uh and you think about writing and tone, like that translates to your audience. Yeah. Well, it's funny because we're doing an audience, uh, you know, mastermind and, uh, you know, have like six or seven people. And this week was the promotion and distribution, uh, uh, module. And of course I was reading your book at the same time and it was like, wow, this is great. And I told them, I was like, look, if you don't believe enough you're in, a, you know, if, uh, you know, in your content to tell other people about it, why should anybody else? Like right. that, you know, is one of those things where like, if you're not excited about this, it's a tall order to expect that somebody else will be. Well, and you can be excited about your work and not know how to talk about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the, the latter is really what brag better is like a lot of it's sentiment, but in a lot of these books, and Brag Better isn't only for women, though my audience does skew women um, towards women, the qualified quiet is irrespective of gender. But, you know, I think there's so much societal stuff going on. There's so many judgments going on. Um, it's about, I-, I cared that it was full of tactics and like mm-hmm. things you can do today, tomorrow, this month. So yeah. that people felt a little bit better. Like it's not just like, "Mm, be proud. Like that doesn't fucking work. Um, because someone telling you how you should feel is just useless. So, you know, these are all tactics and things I've done to myself and trained others that, um, you know, allow you to brag better in a way that is tangible. And, And then I care that it was peppered with interviews of lots of interesting people with very different backgrounds from me, um, talking about how they've experienced bragging better. As the world's largest network of remote professionals, we're here to help. Upwork is giving $1 million in talent grants to projects that counter the ongoing impacts of COVID-19 by connecting existing teams with independent experts in tech, creative, and operations to help save lives, to support communities, and rebuild the economy. Go to upwork.com slash work together to learn more. Yeah. 
Let's talk about those, the self stats piece, because I, I think that, you know, many of us are, are aware of our accomplishments, but you know, like I, I'm pretty sure as I was thinking about that, I was like, Oh, I've sold X number of books. I've written, you know, two books. I have a wall street journal bestseller. One of my friends is like, you pretty much never mentioned that the fact that one of your books is a wall street journal bestseller. He's like, you lead with the other two. And I was like, yeah, that's because it was self published. I don't count it as much. You know, I discount it for that reason. Yeah. That's um, fucking dumb. Yeah, exactly. It's silly, right? <laughs> Even though it, you know, yeah, I'm hopping into like I represent you. I'd be like, well, that's the first thing you say because like, because <laughs> yeah, exactly. like, then you're like, oh, well, like that doesn't count because it was self published. So like, basically, I didn't get the approval of like some random white guy in a tower who <laughs> exactly. like then took two years to publish it. Like, no, that's bullshit. Um, yeah. and and the thing is, here's the thing. That means more to more people than the rest of it because they don't uh-huh. have the framework and they don't understand. When someone hears bestseller, it's like basically like third party validation. Like when you get press um, and you don't say, I've been seen. So I could pitch you and say, I want to be on your podcast and be like, okay, random person. I could be like, you know, I want to be on your podcast. And I've been in the New York Times a bunch and I've written for Forbes and whatever. Those brands are endorsements. Um, mm-hmm. So you'd be crazy not to use that. And the number of people that, you know, don't get there are most people, 99.99999% of people. And when you tell someone you've sold X amount of books, like unless they are an editor or an agent or someone who's also published books, like that doesn't mean anything to them. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think you want to brag in a way that the most amount of people can also understand the accomplishment. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's talk about this idea of being loud. Uh, I think that one of the things that, that often, you know, people mistake loud for is sensationalism, right? So I, I wrote a book called Unmistakable, which is all about, you know, standing out in a sea of noise. And I remember writing, I said, look, you can, you know, stand out in a sea of noise like Paris Hilton, or you can stand that in a, you know, in a sea of noise in another way. It's a real question of, you know, um, mistaking, you know, sort of uh, seeking attention for the sake of attention, but at, you know, getting attention for like some real purpose. Uh how, how do you deal with this loud aspect? Because I think that often gets very confusing. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you that um, I'm a fan of Paris Hilton. And I think that yeah. I've always wanted to write like a very high level media study of the Kardashians. Um, just from as a, like as a media person, I think that these people like that, that have managed to stay relevant and mm-hmm. have managed to break through the noise. Um, I wasn't that big of a fan of hers until I saw her in this documentary um i can't remember what it's called now but it was about like you know you you know youtube online stars people and what she's been able to achieve um you know you might say it's nothing um but i think she's actually really interesting um which you know take it for for what you will um now I forget the original question because I was thinking about Paris. Yeah, I guess the, you know how do you? Yes, so I, I, I completely derailed. Right? I guess you know like the difference between loud and being sensationalist because I think it's you know people can get attention online by like I could post nude pictures of myself and it would probably get a lot of attention. I don't think anybody wants to see that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So no, nobody comes to me when I repre- represent individual clients. They never come to me for ego. People come yeah. to me because they say, I've done all this work and nobody knows about it. I want to get more speaking gigs. I want to sit on a corporate board. I want this raise. I'm doing fundraising. So I better learn how to pitch myself and my business because you know the ultimate form of recognition is money. Um, yeah. So you got to figure out what your goal is. You don't want to just yell to yell. I mean, you can yell to yell, but it's not really what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about here is carving out what you want from visibility. So if that is just your boss to pay more attention to you and appreciate your work, is it you want to be on the speaking circuit and be able to charge, you know, what you're telling everyone else that you charge? Um And then working backwards from there and figuring out how, you know, where the audience for that goal lives and how you're going to get to them and how you're going to brag in their language. Um, And you have to sort of brag and showcase your work to people in a way that they like to see it. So if you are uh, someone who wants more recognition from your boss and your boss is someone who really likes reports, then you know, you can't hop by their office right now, but standing there and telling them everything they've done when they're in the middle of something else and they like reading things is not helpful. If you write them a report once a month about the work you've done, like that's bragging to them in in their language. Um, and mm. the, the point of bragging better, so bragging is facts. It's stating true facts about your work and using them to get the recognition that is going to people who don't deserve it right now. 
um, who are just have figured out how to break through the noise, but haven't done the work that you've done that haven't don't have the knowledge. And this is true in any industry. We can all name someone who is the shiny person that gets the covers that gets the primo speaking slots. And that person is never the most qualified person. That person Mm -hmm. just never is. And so many clients come to me and say like, my product is so much better than his, but like he gets all these write-ups. Like, why is that? I'm like, well, that person's bragging, often bragging better about their work. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's not just to sort of yell into the void. We have so much, so much noise, but it is, you know, bringing the things you've done into the light of day. So not only they can be recognized for your work, but so that you can inspire others to do that. So you can, you know, going back to your you know, putting out the, the amount you get paid, like, so that someone else can be like, wow, like, that's amazing. Um, I have done some of this work. Maybe that's something to work towards. Like you also don't know who you're potentially inspiring. Yeah. Well, let's do this. Let, let's actually take this and, and lay it over uh, a practical example. Cause I know that, you know, you basically go into this whole idea of, you know, the campaign of you. And I think the one that I thought probably would be most relevant if we were to look at it through a, a sort of tactical example was a personal website and bios, because every one of us at this point has that kind of as, as part of our ecosystem. If not, you know, we're going to, it's you yeah. know, <clears throat> particularly people listening to this. Many of them probably are like, okay, how many attempts have we made to rewrite the bio on our website, write the about page? It's like, let me run it through Simon Sinek you know, start with why framework club, you run it through, you know, Donald Miller's framework for story mm-hmm. brands. Like, you know, there's so many different ways that you could do this. Um, but I, you know, I, I was really curious, like when you see something, you know, you look at somebody's bio, like how do you guide them to this and what do you notice that's wrong often? Yeah. So bio stuff. Um, I talk about bios all the time and, uh, I, wrote a piece long ago for Harvard Business Review about bios and some guy read it and called me and was like, will you write my bio? And I was like, it costs this amount of money that I just made up. I was like, yeah, I do that all the time. I was like, yeah, you know, I I could do that, Um, which I could. I mean, I absolutely could. And I was like, well, it costs this amount of money. And he was like, okay. And I was like, oh, okay. I do this now. This is an offering. And I actually write so many bios at this point. So the bio is just an ultimate bragging spot. I mean, bragging is hard. It is sometimes hard to see and receive um, and deal with someone else doing that, whether it, as I said, it highlights something you can't do or is just, you know, a very complicated practice. But the bio is like the OG bragging spot. Um, And I get really (laughs) frustrated. Like if that's a place you expect people to brag, like that is that is already in our minds as somewhere where someone's entire work history and accolades and wins are displayed. And I don't see that changing. And I think I see a lot of people miss that. Um, You know, sometimes for women, I see it getting too cutesy and they're using their first name, not their last name, which you got to use your last name, active pros, hyperlinking out to things, all of your awards, like for you, you know, wall street journal, best-selling, you know, that's where it is because also, you know, people are going to think what they're going to think, but they're yeah. used to seeing brags in a bio. So that is more accepted than a lot of other places, let's say. Mm-hmm. So I believe that everyone needs a long, short, and two-line bio. What really allows you to break through is consistency and repetition. I mean, beating people over the head with your message is something I always want to tell people. We think that people know exactly what we do. We walk around in our heads with like our work and, you know, I think you know exactly what's happening. And people will still come up to me and ask about things I did a decade ago and have no idea that I've been pushing <laughs> bragging for so long. I'm like, how yeah. is it possible that you don't know this? So, so you have to just really be consistent and repetitive, mm-hmm. which means that all your bios need to match. Um, if someone, a conference booker, a recruiter can't figure out who you are and what you want in 30 seconds or under, they're going to move on to someone who's packaged themselves better. But with the mm-hmm. bio, everyone needs a long, short, and two-line bio. Long bio. Everything ever. Every win. Um, you know, you don't need to do like your high school wins, but you know, everything I, I want. I mean, I see people le- le- leave out like awards and major endorsements and that's just dumb. Um, yeah. So that's the kitchen sink. And then from that, you boil down a paragraph, which is your short bio, which you can use 
um, in other places that don't have as much space, or if you're speaking at a conference and they need a short bio, and then a two line bio, which is just two lines about yourself that goes on your social media. They all need to match. You know, put in a quarterly reminder to update your bio so that you don't have to go back and think like years back. No. And then it's about having like a running Google document because we waste all this time. Every time someone asks for a bio, you reinvent the wheel mm-hmm. and then you write it out and you leave some things out and that can be bad. And so much of this uh, also because so much of Brag Better comes from using PR skills is that you want to make it as easy as possible to pitch someone and have them pay attention to you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because I, I, like, I realized I've been helping people deal with productivity issues and, you know, this ranges from my roommates to the people in our, our mastermind unanimously. The, the one issue I keep running across is people are a disaster productivity wise because of how they organize information. Yeah. And yours is just one example of that. It's like, you know, there's so much information in so many different silos. I'm like, so you spend half your day looking for shit. No wonder you're not getting anything done. Right. Yeah, I mean that's that's really important. Um, but yes, having this document that you constantly upload that's the same everywhere. Because, like for example, you know, if you have your paragraph bio and you are just taking the time to type it out, you might forget something that would mean a lot to someone at that conference, let's say, and no. then you can't capitalize on it. You can't get hired. You can't like if you forget to list all the other places you've spoken and you have the yeah. short bio, then people are like, oh, this might be their first gig. This is their first rodeo. Um, yeah. which sucks. Well, it, it's weird. Like I'm thinking about all the various things that I don't have anywhere on, you know, my website. I was like, oh, wow. I'm like, I have a Berkeley undergrad degree. I'm pretty sure that's not mentioned anywhere on my website. Uh, you know, yeah. and it's, it's weird thinking about all this with you because I'm like, oh, wow. Uh, but I think that one of the other things that, you know, you go into this, this part three, which is, you know, to me, it seems like you basically provided, you know, the theoretical components in part one the tactical components in part two and the psychological components in part three, uh, just based on having read this. But I, I think the two things that really struck me that you said were fear is normal and dissent is powerful. And I want to start with the dissent piece because Justine Musk um, once said to me, she said, if you have a bold and compelling point of view, it's going to piss people off. And that mm-hmm. always stayed with me. And so every time I get an email, it, like literally I've had the spectrum be, your work is a disservice to humanity to this is a gift to the world. Yeah. (laughs) Like, you know, as, as opposite extremes as you could get, but you know, why is it that people resist dissent despite knowing that, you know, anything that resonates with people is going to be polarizing. Yeah. So, I mean, yes, dissent is powerful, but it is also, um, a sign that you are saying something of note and you are actually gaining traction in that audience. So, um, you know, my most, one of my more recent endeavors is a podcast called it never gets old about, um, this world of secondhand and, uh, resale consignment, vintage, sustainable fashion. Um, and I, I, you know, there, there are a lot of people that support me and they say nice things and whatever. And I got my first, uh, really nasty review and, it was about my voice, which we love nothing more than policing women's voices. Um, but it's still, I mean, I think about it and I write about it, you know, like I, I feel it. Um, but, you know, that means that someone took the time to like open up their Apple iTunes app or whatever and like type out this thing. Um, so it actually means you're winning. Like if everyone's just agreeing with you, you're not saying anything interesting and you're not going to gain more of an audience. Like the sign that you're growing an audience is that people start to disagree with you and they disagree with you loudly. Um, and you know, I'm not necessarily only talking about like the cesspool of the comment section, which sometimes just totally needs to be destroyed. But like you, you're, you know, and, and Lovey Ajayi, who I interview in the book and is a friend, you know, she talks about how, like, if, you know, nobody's disagreeing with you, you're probably not saying anything interesting or you're not saying it, you know, you're not, you're not really pushing yourself and you're not really coming up with new ideas. Um, And I think that like people are always going to disagree with you, but it is a sign that you are getting outside of just the um, echo chamber of people that care about you and that like you and that are going to say nice things to you. Um, And so that, that's actually proof of concept. Um, Well, that's why I always say like, when somebody says, Hey, I just got my first two star review on my book. I'm like, congratulations. That means you're finally reaching people that don't like you. Exactly. And, and yeah. listen, like I hate, you know, on my podcast, a hate stream is a hate stream. Like keep listening to it and hating it. Like it, yeah. you know, um, 
so you you don't have to be there. You, you can just not. You can just look away. You can just not mm-hmm. review it. So you know whether you're a spou- like whatever end of the spectrum of emotion you're espousing, it still means you're eliciting something from people um, yeah. that makes them want to act on it. And and so that's wild. Well, it's funny because if you if you um, if you've ever seen the movie Private Parts, like uh, the Howard Stern movie, like the there's a researcher that comes in and basically tells the marketing guys like, well, here's the deal. It was like, you know, everybody listens on average for two hours. Um, and he basically said people who hate the guy listen for two hours and both yeah. groups of people say, why? And it was like, because I just want to see what he's going to say next. So even the people who hated him tuned in. You know, yeah, uh, which was such a great example to me of okay, you you know, um, if you're willing to be polarizing, even if you know there are people who will hate you, but still somehow listen to you regularly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you know, haters is a sign that you're you're making it because the yeah. bigger you are, the more people that are going to come for you because they're jealous, because they're angry, because you elicit something in them, an emotion in them, even if it's a negative one. That's power. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's one thing I, I don't want to leave this conversation um, without talking about, because uh, you've alluded to it throughout our conversation, and I know that you referenced it throughout the book. Uh, and that is, is you know, when it, it, the, the <clears throat> contrast in terms of, of gender between you know, like women and men, when you're dealing with this whole idea of bragging better, do men not have any insecurity about this? Or are they just obnoxious about it? Or like, what is the what is the difference? And how does it play out? Yeah, so um I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and experiencing this. So uh, bragging better is so much harder for women for many, many reasons. Positive attributes historically have been associated with positive behaviors. So she was coy. She was demure. She was quiet. You know, the the message is shut up and look pretty. Um, That's the messaging. And then you see what happens when you are a woman who puts herself in public. You're policed from your ankles to your voice. Um, Are you too pretty? Are you not pretty enough? Are you you know, the impossible tightrope of age. Um, and then that like, you know, doubles and triples for women of color, um, and, and so many other layers of just bias, uh, and all the different isms. So I really cared that brag better and that my audience, the qualified quiet be irrespective of gender and of race. And to say that the ability to be heard isn't layered with privilege is just stupid. It is. Um, And that's a whole other book and and deeply complex. But men definitely have this issue too. It's not to say that they don't. Um, You know, I care a lot that women feel comfortable talking about themselves and putting themselves in public despite the actual real dangers. Um, It's just different for men. And I did an interview with a men's outlet and, you know, sort of like, well, do you want men to shut up? I'm like, no, we desperately need you. I mean, the research on men echoing, like we are, you are the default voice we listen to. Um, and that is, you know, also scientifically proven when men echo the sentiments of women, they get, you know, heard. So we need mm-hmm. you to co-sign voices. So much of bragging better is about bragging better for others. Like we've been talking about doing it for yourself, but, you know, certainly feeling, I feel like a rising tide lifts all boats, that there's enough room on the stage for everyone. Um, and that, so much of of doing this is learning to do so for others and help, you know, pass that microphone to people whose voices we don't get to hear. So I think that men also have a responsibility. Um, I want them to be helped by this book and read it and understand it. And I have no doubt it affects them. It hits a little different. Um, but it's also just everyone's job. If you have a speck of privilege in terms of being a voice that people listen to, you know, for me as a white woman being, you know, someone that, that people listen to, I've experienced, you know, varying degrees of sexism in my career, but I don't have to experience racism. Like I don't have to Mm -hmm. experience homophobia. Um, And so part of my job also is to help elevate the voices of others. So I hope that, you know, being a woman in public is, is much, much more complex for so many mm-hmm. different reasons. Um, and so there's there's some of that in this book. Um, I went with my publisher because they had a vision for this book that went beyond gender. Um, and I think a lot of people would have let me publish it as like the feminist manifesto that no. a couple iterations ago that it was. Um, but men certainly have this problem. I, I work with tons of men. I don't only work with women. I work with tons of men that have the same stuff. Um, it just, there are so many things you don't have to worry about as a man who decides to use his voice. Um, mm-hmm. And so it doesn't mean it doesn't happen to you, but it means it looks different. 
Um, and then there are things you need to understand. And then there are obligations, I think, and duties that you have that also just genuinely make you look better in inclusion of voices. Yeah. Well, so, you know, I have two final questions about this. Um, what about race? You know, like I wonder this as an Indian person because, you know, I've, I've had experiences with friends who are, are white and they go into some situation. Like I was with my roommate, we were in some place in Colorado and, you know, we walked in this hotel and everybody was like yucking it up with a bartender. And, you know, here I walk in and the place goes silent and he notices like the blatant racism. And I'm like, let's just get a wine and a burger. It's been a long day. Uh, and it never even like caught my attention. Mm hmm. Did it not catch your attention because it's something you're used to or I'm just desensitized to it at this yeah. point, you know, yeah. it's kind of like, I think white people are more concerned about racism towards Indian people than Indian people are. Well, I will say I cared a lot about the privilege aspect of this book. Um, and so I made sure to interview like, so basically I was like, how do I deal with this? And do I do a whole chapter on it? And I don't want it to be the chapter on like non-white people. Like that's ridiculous. Um, well, so I just decided to pass the mic and elevate voices of interesting people who have different backgrounds from me. Many people of color, women of color, disabled women of color, trans people. Um, there's actually only one man interviewed in the book. Sorry. Um, couldn't find any other men to interview. It was just kind of hard. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I highlighted a lot of those things. The race portion, I don't have to deal with. And that is mm -hmm. just fact um, and something that, I think about a lot. Um, and I remember being on a big panel and, uh, this woman raised her hand and she was like, you know, I'm, I'm a Latina woman. Like, how do I avoid being stereotyped at work? And it was only in that moment that I realized that we were four white women on a panel. Um, mm -hmm. and I was like, Oh fuck, this is a bad look. And everyone started with like frameworks and bullshit. And I was like, skip me the microphone. I was like, listen, I don't have to deal with that. And I'm sorry. That is a whole other layer that I, I acknowledge as a blind spot for me and wish that I could understand. Um, and I'm sorry. And like, yeah. that was just sort of all that needed to be said. And I, I thought about that a lot in the book. Um, and it's just not, I don't know shit about squat about it. Like, cause it hasn't yeah. affected me. And so instead I just let people speak to what it's like being, you know, black woman professional at a high level or, you know, what it's like being a trans woman in a room of executives, um, in the interviews that, that I included. Hmm. Amazing. Well, um, I have one final question for you, which is how we finish all of our interviews at the unmistakable creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Hmm. There's so many ways to interpret this question. Yeah. That makes them simply unmistakable or also unmistakably creative. However you want to answer it. Okay. Hold on. I'm buying myself time. And <laughs> no worries. I'd say a commitment to self um, is just sort of the first thing that pops into my head. I think you sort of just like know when you meet someone and they're really in their them, you know, their themness or theirness or meanness or whatever. Like they're just like really themselves. Um, I think that's cool. And I think it's like, to me, at least dead obvious when people aren't, I've worked a lot at like, not just being like a, a robot, even though I want everyone to like, think I'm shiny and cool and don't have any flaws. Um, so I would say someone that really just has a strong sense of self and you can tell. Amazing. Um, well, where can people find out more about you, your work, uh, the book and everything else that you're up to? Yes. For the love of God, please order Brag Better. Um, so you can learn more about me at meredithfeynman.com. Uh, you can learn more about Brag Better at brag-better.com. It is available wherever you get your books. If you want to support indie bookstores or that big guy, up to you. Um, I narrated it so you can listen to my vocal fry in your ears. Um, and I, I would say my, I'm on all the social medias or whatever, but my, uh, Instagram, which is also Meredith Feynman is where I post all my best memes. Um, and that's where you can find me just, you know, get at me in any way. Um, and I'm really happy to have done this. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared. 
Did you know that with Drizzly, you can actually get drinks delivered right to your door in under 60 minutes? Yep. With Drizzly, the number one alcohol delivery app, all you have to do is open the app, shop a huge selection of beer, wine, and liquor, and hit order. Plus, you can shop across multiple stores in your area to find what you want at the best prices. Download the app or visit drizzly.com, that's D-R-I-Z-L-Y, and use code SAVE to save $5 on your first order today.